Welcome to Uptown Rumble, heavy music in the Bronx. My name is Stephen Payne, director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is March 19th, 2024, and very happy to be here for another oral history. Um, Albert, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Um, how you doing? My name is uh, Albert Ramos. Everybody know me as, as Tito, and um, I was a vocalist for uh, Driven by Hatred, uh, New York Hardcore, back in their early mid-90s. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Tito. Um, so why don't you start off by talking a little bit about your family history and background and share whatever you know about how your family ended up in the Bronx? All righty. Um, I guess my story starts on um, 158th Street down in the South, South Bronx. That's that's the apartment where in the, when I was born, that's where my mother and father lived. Um, across the street from them or down the hall or next door or something like that, my grandparents lived. So my parents, my father came to the Bronx. I think he was like 15 years old when he came over by himself from Puerto Rico. And um, my mom was already living here. So they met up and I guess she was in her late teens, early 20s and my dad was like 20 something. So I know they had like 15 years apart from each other. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. And it was like a big gap, but so was customaries back in the day, you know? Sure. Um, and they got together in 1972. They had me. And then back in, back in that, in those days, um, if you remember the Bronx was always on fire, all the fires were going down. And, uh huh. All the insurance claims. So I grew up in the world where everything is just totally smashed. You know, it looked like what pictures of Berlin look like now after like the bombings. Every the buildings were just demolished and crumbling. It was like if you watched the if you watched the the movie like with the Fort Apache, the Bronx. That was the Bronx that I lived in. It was just all desolate. But it was good times. Everybody was pure. I don't remember any racism or anything like that or against people. Everybody was just good with each other because everybody was trying to get along you know what um to get to me. what what cross street did you live at 158th street and if you remember i'm the not cross sure i know the actual address was 1616 158th street okay i see and how, how long were you at that apartment um when i turned five um my parents and my grandparents got together and said we had to move out of here because they were afraid the building was going to be one of the ones on fire i see so, they got together and uh, they found a couple apartments up on uh, Monroe Avenue, which is just off Tremont and the concourse. Yeah, yeah. It's like on the other side of that big pointed building that looks like a, a sliced block of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, so we um, we got an apartment there and they got the apartment across the hall. My grandparents got the apartment across the hall. Ah, I see. I see. Do you have very many um, memories from your time at the 158th Street apartment? Um, Just how everything was just always, always messed up. I remember there was always people in the street. There was yeah. always how did you go outside? You know, there's people yelling, people playing games in the street. It was just like a big, giant playground. You know, wow. where we go playing in the bricks and, you know, there'd be abandoned cars and just jump around and but I was so young, and you know, you was, you know, you was being handheld, or I just remember everything being really weird and kind of tense outside. You know, it was nice and calm in the house, but it was always tense outside. I see. I see. Did you have other family other than your grandparents that lived near you? Um, at that point, I don't remember where my uncles and cousins lived. Yeah, but I know um, we would always go to visit. Uh, some people and it was always in the buildings and you know you always have to walk upstairs and it was always the same smells and sounds where uh they lived so it was i can't imagine it was too far yeah yeah and did you did you make any friends during that period of your life um that you like stayed in touch with afterwards or just other kids in the neighborhood you played with and lost touch with no, I started, I started my recollections and memories really started when we moved to Monroe Avenue when I was five. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes sense. That makes sense. 
Um, so on Monroe Avenue, what was your apartment like? Um, you know, what floor did you live on? Describe your apartment a little bit. Um, I think we lived, uh, let me see, if I looked at the building in my mind's eye, it was like one, two, about the third floor. Yeah, yeah. Third floor facing the street because my dad, we used to hang on, when it was really hot, we used to hang out on the fire escape after you get out from work. Sure. And listen to music, you know, the guys on the street had the big radios on the corners and stuff like that. And it was, you know, I remember hearing salsa music and rap music and just people, you know, just hanging out. Yeah. Trying to stay cool, you know. That's right. Yeah, I remember bats coming into the window, so it wasn't too high. <laughs> we had bats <laughs> in the apartment and stuff like that. It was just, you know, it was freaky to a kid. I remember the floors were like this sky blue color with glitter. Like the wow. the, yeah, the car. I, I remember I was like, that was, I don't know, it was just fascinating for me. It was just all colors and stuff. As a five year old, you know, you pick up on stuff like that. And what was, um, what was the vibe of that neighborhood compared to the 158th street? Did you still, or do you still remember having like a fear of fires or fires being in that neighborhood or, or it was a different um, vibe? The, we didn't have a lot. I didn't never felt like uh, a fear of fires and stuff like that, or basically yeah. a, a fear of everything. It was just, it was a lot less people on the street and it was a little bit more calm. I see. But uh, I I do recall. I mean, the first time I was mugged, I was five. Some kids mugged me for my steer, my uh, my big wheel. Oh. Like this, yeah. <laughs> I got jacked for a big wheel. My dad told because my dad had told me not to go up onto the concourse by myself. They'll go around the block to stay in front. And the first thing yeah. I do, because he told me not to, was go around the block. And yeah, I was walking back. <laughs> so my that was my record. Oh. I remember my dad. My dad was like, he wasn't mad that I got my. He was pissed off because I didn't pay attention. See, that's what you get, and it was a, a life lesson. <laughs> yeah. Um, talk about your your parents a little more, if you if you know, as long as you feel comfortable doing so. Like a little bit of what they were like, um, what kind of jobs they might have done, that kind of stuff. Um. Well, I. When I went, while I was in school, I would stay with my grandparents because they lived across the hall. So I was basically raised by my uh, my grandma and because uh, my mom and my dad were always at work, you know, doing the doing the hard stuff to, you know, keep a uh, head, of, you know, roof over our heads and food on the table. Yeah. But uh, my dad worked down in Manhattan and he worked in the garment district. He would uh, do a lot of the cutting for the um, dresses and stuff like that. Oh, and, um, okay. What is uh, something tile? It's like uh, the materials and stuff like that that would come in rolls overseas. And they yeah. cut it up into the dress size and then somebody else would switch it. I see, I see, I see. So he was a, he was a pretty big manager out there for like the Italian uh, mafia families because that was all mafia owned. Uh-huh. And uh, he had told me that, you know, since he had come over and from he was 15 when he came over from Puerto Rico, the first people that actually took care of him were uh, some of the uh, Italian families. And, oh, they, you know, he did work for them, but he wouldn't tell me what it was. Yeah. But they eventually put him in, in office and, and uh, put him in charge of stuff and that type of thing. Sure. Um, my mom also worked in Manhattan and she made. She was in charge of making like the. I don't know what you call them, the little crowns for weddings and, okay. and stuff. Yeah. The little veils and this, that, and the other thing. And uh, she would design all those things and put the rubies in and and that type of thing for some from big. It was a it was a big, pretty important company. One of the ones to have the big uh, catalog that you can order from, where all the all the bougie bougie people, you know. <laughs> all the, so, so they were making not a lot of money, but it was an okay money that you know. Yeah, my 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 belly wasn't empty. Yeah, 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 yeah. What what kinds of things do you remember eating on a regular basis growing up, either in oh, your house or on the street? Yeah, to this day I won't eat chicken, chicken or fish. My yeah. mom said I ate so much chicken as a child that she doesn't understand why, but I probably lost the taste of it. It's like I probably that's probably all I ate was probably chicken. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no more Spanish stuff that you know pasteles and. You know, for the holidays and, and the normal stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
on the Puerto Rican stuff. <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and what about you? You mentioned a little music you'd, you'd hear on the street, um, but talk a little bit more about the music that you heard around you, you know, before before you necessarily started developing your own taste and all, but just the music you heard around you in your house, on the street, um, right. the music you remember. Uh, I remember a lot of salsa music. Yeah. I remember um, some Pedro on the Baja. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, type, you know, stuff that everybody was telling stories. Um, there was, I don't know if you call it, it was like the early days of rap music. Hey, ding, 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 ah. I remember all that, you know, and yeah, uh, I don't know if they were break dancing back then. It hadn't I don't break dancing hadn't started yet. Yeah. But the bell bottom, I remember bell bottoms, I remember funny looking um tank tops <laughs> and stuff like that. I remember afros and you know, I mean all the girls had potty mouths, so to speak. You know, <laughs> I was saying, I was always cursing around. Nobody could say anything without like four or five, you know, f bombs or this, that, and the other thing. And nobody yeah. would speak to each other. Everybody would yell. I don't know. It's about Spanish people, and and the, 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 they get a they get their point across by yelling at each other. I don't, I don't know. It's like nobody talks softly. <laughs> it's, it's like cool, it's crazy, but that's that's what I remember. Uh I remember sitting on the fire escape with my dad and this car jumped the curb and hit this one guy. And I think that was my first, um, I think that was my first experience with somebody getting like, like killed and stuff like that. Yeah. So Ooh. I still wow. remember that in my mind's eye at five. Yeah. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. What, how, how'd you process that? What'd your dad say when that happened? And, you know, it was we were just watching, and the cops would come, and you know they. I still remember them just covering the body, and the people around. It was just like nothing. You know, they just walk by, and it was like, it was like no big deal, you know. Yeah. So to me, it became no big deal either. You know, it's yeah. like I do what the grown ups do. If they're not worried about it, why should I be worried about it? Yep. Yeah, but I still remember them, and in, 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 you know those those images. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what what elementary school did you go to? Oh, uh, we went to. I, well, I went to a bunch. I remember. I can't remember. It had to be somewhere near. Well, you know what? It probably wasn't somewhere too close because I just remember jumping on the bus. I see. I see. I see. I see. My mom would take me out to the corner wherever with us. The yellow bus would show up. I'd jump in and we'd go to some school. And I think we yeah. changed that like three times or something like that. Two, three times. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So you were going like to a different neighborhood entirely, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Because I remember, you know, you get used to one set of kids in your class and then it'd be a whole different thing. And I don't know the reason why we were changing. or So I was just along for the ride. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Do, you, do you have very many um, uh, like memories from your elementary school years? Like in school, not from that time period where we lived on Tremont, but um, in 1977 we moved a little further north. Oh, where'd you move in? 77? We moved um, Marion Avenue, uh, just north of um, uh, Fordham Road. I see. Yeah. I see. I see. I see. Um, did your grandparents move with you as well? Yeah, yeah, yes. At that point, um, since at the when we were at um, Monroe Avenue, they had the two facing apartments. Well, they got together and they decided to go all in on a on a house. So we got the house on Marion Avenue. And it was my, my grandparents, my parents, me, and my sister, who had just uh, moved. Yeah. Uh, I see, I see, I see, I see. Um, and what was Ma the Marion Avenue place like? Oh, it was it was like a paradise. It was a house. They had trees in front. You know, it was like quiet. At that point, the 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 streets were still cobblestone. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And they had the slates like on the sidewalk. It wasn't just a concrete sidewalk. It was like dirt on the side with the, these big slates and stuff like that on the middle. So yeah, it was. We had a backyard for the first time. We 
trees and it, it was pretty neat. Wow. How how long were you at that place? Um, I was at that place till I left home. Okay. At okay. 26. And my sister and my parents just sold it a year ago. I think they just sold it and moved out. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's like the long-term family home then for a yeah, long time. Yeah, that was yeah, that was the last place that we all lived as a family. Wow, okay, okay. Um so so if you moved in 77, you were you were you still 5 at that point or um yeah, cuz I'm 5 years older than my sister, so I must have been a 5, maybe turning 6 when when she came over. Yeah. I see. So so you were just at the um, Monroe place for I guess a short short little bit. Um, yeah, I can imagine it was way, way too long. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about like junior high, what junior high you went to and what memories you have from your years in junior high school? Um, junior high school was uh, uh, Our Lady of Refuge. It was a Catholic, high, uh, Catholic junior high. It went from sixth grade to eighth grade, I think. I see. I see. Where where is that junior high located? One ninety sixth Street, right across the street from PS forty six. That's right. That's right. Right. Uh, um, and yeah, what was that like for you? Had you had you been to Catholic schools before that? Did you go to any Catholic elementary schools off and on or anything like that? No, I went from, I think, fourth. Hmm. Well, before I went to Our Lady of Virtue, I went to PS46, which is right across the street. Oh, I see, I see, I see. So I basically went from that school across the street. And then uh, it was kind of the Catholic high school, was, or the Catholic school was a little weird because you had to wear uniforms and stuff like that. And you had to go to church because you had to put money in the little envelope so that you could go to the school and, and the stand and the other thing. So it was a little different. The classes were... Um, the classes were nicer. The teachers were a lot more brutal. And I mean, literally brutal. Yeah. Like that slap on the hand with the ruler, like the, like these these little ones that you have around and stuff. No, they had the long yardsticks and they'd smack uh -huh. them. Up, you know, and I was never exposed to like people actually being able to do that, you know. So it was kind of scary yeah. at first, but, but you fell in line. You know, they could still grab you by your ear. They could still, you know put you in the corner and you know, all the stuff that they didn't do in public school, yeah. you know, then you had sister Mary sunshine and then, you know, whatever their names were in, <laughs> they were, they were intense. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've heard, I've heard plenty of stories about that. Different yeah. Catholic schools around the Bronx, man. Um, <laughs> did you, did you, uh, were you already like getting into, music at this point or was that a little later on just so i know for frame of reference um when did i start getting music i was always into like the rap music because that's what i was surrounded you know yeah sure um but if you're talking about like when like the whole metal thing came up it probably didn't even start with metal i mean my thing was always how music made me feel yeah. Like, whatever mood I wanted, that's what I was listening to. Sure. Mm -hmm. And back then, they had, like, Diamond Girl and all that other crazy stuff going on, you know? And that's what you hear in the streets and, like, the early rap songs and stuff like that. It was, like, Curtis Blow, the Fat Boys. Absolutely. Um, stuff like that. And um, I think what made me feel the best was when uh, Rockbox came out by Run DMC. Uh huh. Oh, that's a brilliant sign. I would say, wait, this is making me feel different than you know, just the the fat boys or something singing. You know, this has a lot more energy. It makes me want to smash something. You know, what I'm saying it, it's it it gets you more intense, more worked up. Right. You, you know who else mentioned that song? Uh, um, Mel from Shaquan and and Demise. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, he had he had a similar similar kind of experience with that song he heard that that like you know the light bulb went off but and i think right. also that guitarist um what's his name eddie martinez i think uh, i i i have to i have to go back and check but he's what whatever his name is he's from the bronx mm -hmm. um 
anyway, but I, yeah, anyway, rock box, that's such a good song. Um, but keep going. I just wanted to add yeah. that in. Yeah. And it's funny because it's not rock music, but it's that feeling, you know, it's that first taste of that energy. You know, yeah. this is something different. It makes you want to do something different. You know, yeah. it gives that, that feeling of uh, invincibility kind of, you know. So I became a Run DMC fan and they they used uh, guitars and stuff to, you know, to a good day. And then the King of Rock came out and it was over. It was like, yep. bam, you know, I'm King of bah, bah, bah. It was like, what? This is intense. You know, not even the greatest rap song made me feel like, you know, just fucking bobbing my head and, uh-huh. and just, you know, it was like, oh, this is the, this is the you know, the shiznik, I guess. As you would say back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, so it was like, wow. And at this point, at that point, I had no idea what metal was. I mean, yep. you know, I had I was listening to Fordham. <laughs> I was listening to I remember listening to Fordham University one night and, and they had uh I don't know, Crucial Chaos or something like that. The punk rock stuff, you know, it was but I never yep. knew any bands. And it was just like three chord bands, you know, blah, blah, blah. And at one point they played on uh, Hello Waits. Now I know, now I know it's a Hello Waits, but the beginning was all creepy. You know, you got the demon sounds and uh-huh. well, I, threw, I threw my headphones off so fast. I was so fucked uh, It scared the hell out of me. And I was like, no, I'm not going <laughs> And then they started talking about Jesus Christ and, you know, this, that. I was like, oh, hell no. You know, I was afraid <laughs> demons were going to jump out and I was going to be possessed. And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm not wow. Good. <laughs> yeah, wow. So, so yeah, I mean, I guess all all of this stuff's coming out like 84, 85. So you're 12, 13, somewhere around yeah. there, right? Yeah, somewhere on there. And wow. then I ran into, and then I ran, that's when about that time is when I ran into the, uh, um, you know, it sounded good. It's because it was all vinyl and tapes, yeah. you know? So uh, I, I asked my mom if I could do the Columbia house thing and she said, no. And I was like, you know, and I was naive. I was saying, well, it's just a penny, you know? <laughs> so I did it anyway, you know? And, uh, I just ordered stuff that looked cool. Cause back then you used to go to the, the, um, record stores on Fordham road. And you didn't know what anything was when you just pick out covers and stuff like that. And just, and, and listen to stuff. So I picked stuff that was cool looking you know and and kind of crazy because i was looking for something different now uh, i got a whole bunch of run dmc albums um this is all vinyl um i got i got the master of puppets i got on uh, like a judas priest album um a twisted sister album uh i think like a maybe a van halen album i'm not sure and yeah. stuff like that not knowing what it was you know it might have even had like a suggested box thing you know what's in so i might have been just clicking on that yeah so yeah, I, yeah. I, I got that all in the mail and you know i think the first one i threw on was like uh judas priest it was like turbo lover album and it, it was cool driving music you know it made me want to like just nod my head and stuff twist is just it was kind of funny it made me laugh you know um, and yeah, and then the Master of Puppets album, like I went through that on, and it was like, print, 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 print. actually, no, it was no, it was, I think Battery was first. It was like, wah, wah, uh-huh. you know, oh, this shit is boring as hell. Then it was like, bah, 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 you know, it was like, holy moly, it just went from like zero to like 5,000. And I was like, whoa, this is, this is intense. This is interesting. And they weren't singing anything scary that was going to scare you, you know? That's it, right. It was like, <laughs> Yeah, so because imagine the Catholic school kid, you know, listening to demon stuff, you know, you, 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 <laughs> that's embedded, you know, at, at that point it was a country, you know, didn't know no better. Uh, wow. Yeah, and that was we were off on the races on that. Did you listen to those albums like I, I, on your family's uh, like stereo record player, or whatever? Yeah, downstairs. Um, and, they, and they had they had like the big headphones with the big giant jack and, and like uh-huh. the curly screw pigtail little thing sticking in there because I couldn't turn it up you know with my mom my grandma listening to you know it was like <laughs> I was I was gonna ask you if you listen to it with headphones or if you if you let your let your parents and grandparents hear what you're listening to <laughs> no um so were there other kids at your school? who were like getting into this kind of music at the time that you were friends with? 
Um, I have a lot of friends, but I don't remember anyone listening to music, but to, to metal type music at that at the Catholic school because because I was still into rap music too, you know. Sure, I sure, could, sure. I could recite every Run DMC song there was, you know. My friend would, I I do DMC and he do Run and we just go at it and you know and we you know sing for people, <laughs> you know. And rap and stuff like people, but I was into other things too. So it was like the metal music. I mean, music wasn't like something that I even thought of partaking in at the time. You know, I was into graffiti and all the street and all the street things. You know. Okay, you were into graffiti too. What did did you what did you write? Did you have a tag that you um, wrote all the time, or you tried out different things? No, I was a numbskull and wrote Tito everywhere. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's so, funny. that was the fastest way to fame you know but just, yeah. you know. <laughs> now did you try out like breaking at all i mean like because it like you said it it wasn't really dude, around in the 70s but in the 80s i did know? i i did yeah, i sucked at it so bad <laughs> it really sucked so yeah. so we, we had the cardboard down on our corner um on my street because it was just a bunch of kids on my corner in streets and you know, when we tried to break thing, and it turned into like wrestling matches, and then it turned into fights. So you learn how to fight really well. Just through, it became MMA, street corner MMA. You know, <laughs> it started to break dancing with the music, and then you know you get into it, and you know, next thing you know, there's like a battle royale on the corner, and everybody's beating shit out of each other. It's, <laughs> it was a lot more fun than the actual break dancing. <laughs> yeah. uh, and. Were there like um, were there any like parties and and parks that you were going to as far as um, you know, any kind of hip hop jams or like community centers or anything like that? I didn't do any community centers. They were still on um, block parties. Yeah, they, they still held black part block parties like on Palm Place, and where there wasn't too much traffic and that type of thing. And that was always cool. You no, know, back then you didn't have to worry about shootouts or nothing like that. You know, if people got into it, it was still skin on skin. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, it might yeah. be two on one here and there, but it was still skin on skin. And you know, and the next day everybody's playing stickball together again. You know, yeah. and it wasn't like somebody's gonna vendetta and come at you with a gun like they do now. Like a week later, you gotta watch your back and stuff like that. It's like, so it wasn't. Were there um any like crews in your neighborhood that you had to like watch out for or anything um, like that? Primarily um on that corner it was the Nietas and Latin Kings kind of yeah. on that corner down on Decatur and down a little further on Marion. Yeah. And uh, the, basically, the crew that hung out on my corner didn't really have a name. It was just uh, all all the locals and stuff like that. Sure, sure, yeah, and, yeah. And you know, all the families are intermixed, so even if you were one or the other, you know, it's at that it wasn't like some like a blood or crypt or something like that coming from somewhere else. Totally, you know. Right. So everybody knows each other, and if you got problems, you either go talk it out or you just fucking start doing the little. I, I used to call it the dance. You know, you get into these legit fights and you're dancing around and, and posturing for the first 10 minutes. Are you ever going to throw a goddamn punch? Are you going to do, you know, do <laughs> do your funny. little peacock dance and, you know, and, and get to a fight, you know, four punches in, nobody wants to fight no more. It's like, you know, <laughs> it didn't, it didn't get squashed really quick or it gets really savage and somebody gets the, their shit knocked out real quick and then it's over. That's right. You know? That's right. Um, and where did you go to high school after you finished at the Catholic Junior High? I went to All Hollows um, High School. It was an all oh, boys. Oh, okay. School. I see. So yeah. you stayed the Catholic school route then, huh? Yeah, my mom decided that was better for me, and I wasn't the smartest kid on the block. It's like I, I got into some of the mediocre better because you take you know you take the exam. Yeah. I don't know what it was back in the day, and you place and you get you put in for uh, the other high schools. Like if you did really well, you could go to like um, Spelman or or the one on Fordham or you know Fordham or whatever. Oh yeah, yeah I was yeah. on the bottom of the bucket. My math skills were so atrocious 
that uh, it was either all hollow Spellman or somewhere else. I see. I think I think Spellman was a little smarter than all hollows, and all hollows was was small. So she thought that would be better and, you know, give me a better chance of actually graduating. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, um, did you know some of the kids, from, like, did some of the kids from your junior high uh, go to All Hollows with you? No, they were all too bright. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you, I guess you had to restart, I guess, start over when you went to yeah. All Hollows, like, make new friends and all of that, huh? Yeah, I went totally, totally blind, not knowing anybody. I see. So... Talk about your your years at All Hollows, some and what all was going on with you, and um, you know whether musically or other aspects of your life, just you know what all was going on with you in high school. Um, high school, I think, is when the metal actually was starting to come in. I yeah, because I remember. Yeah, because I remember I met um uh, my buddy Don Murphy and my friend uh, Kevin Quigley, and uh. Don eventually went on to uh, become the drum, the first drummer driven by Hatred. Uh -huh. And uh, him and Kev, they introduced me to a, a bunch of tapes and stuff like that. And because uh, I was, I was into some metal, so we could we could speak the lingo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And n neither three of us were the brightest ones, you know. And so we kind of hung out together. So we were a little like, like the the nerdy rock you know niche group in every high school you know <laughs> so we those dudes you know we I, we'd get in trouble for trying to grow our hair a little bit longer because you had to had to know the hair had to be cut above the color and this and the other thing so they, they kind of um, both said about that do you remember some of the tapes that they introduced you to uh at the time yeah, Don was into a little bit more of the rockish stuff, and uh, his cousin played drums for Laz Rocket back in the day. Oh, okay, okay. Wow. And uh, so he had that. He was into docking and that type of stuff, and yeah. it was all you know, it was all guitars and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, um, Kevin was getting into some more of the European uh, metal, and that stuff was more like epic Conan the Barbarian, like music you know it had just big giant themes and open chords and you know we are the barbarians of the wasteland or some type <laughs> that type of music yes, it's like sir. yeah these they, there's a name for that they play it really fast <laughs> they're real technical and stuff like that they play yeah. it for yeah so he was into that type of stuff so i got into that and some of that and then yeah. i was in like the metallica and then he introduced me uh don was the first one to introduce me to testament they say, well, if you like Metallica, you'll like these Testament guys. And I was like, yeah, that's all right and stuff like that. But it still wasn't like something I wanted to even thought about doing. You know, it was just cool. I think maybe MTV was starting to come out. I don't know right there. Yeah, I mean, I, right associated, I, I associated like metal with like hot chicks. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because that yeah. was on the media videos, right? Yeah. <laughs> You know, because we're surrounded by, you know, not that the Spanish chicks are hot, but everybody's got this hood attitude and they yeah. dress up really with braids and stuff. And then you look at these rock videos and, you know, they're all in spandex and mini skirts. And I was like, dude, that's the shit right there. So I was like, I, it was like intertwined with that. <laughs> it was like something different. Um, do you, where would you, I, you mentioned, you know, the rec, the record store, the Fordham Road. Would you go to other places to get tapes? I mean, the Columbia deal too, of course, but um, but where else would you go to get music? That was it, really. And that was usually mostly uh, hip-hop music. Sure. Uh, you know, stuff to add to crates. My, I had a couple buddies that were DJs, so I listened to their hip-hop, and they were they were learning how to scratch and, and mix and stuff like that. Back back in the day, the scratching and stuff was was big. So I was trying that, and they were trying to teach me. My buddy Kevin had a, a big brother that was just an awesome DJ. And, you know, I'm there destroying my mom's needles, you know, for the, you know, <laughs> making a lot of noise to get, you know, just normal New York kid stuff. You know, yeah. the, the metal scene, it was never like a, a big thing to, sure. to even get in there. Sure. Yeah. Would, would you get um? Would you get like? Would, was it mostly like um? Tapes that you'd record uh, or that other people would record for you? Like, how would you get your like metal tapes or things like that? Um, 
the mental tapes. Where did they get the mental tapes from? I probably found out, figured out. I probably put the little tape recorder, do the little school thing in front of the speakers when my mom was around and my grandma on and just played it on the, the vinyl and probably recorded yep. it on the tape. Yep. Something, something. I probably did something like that knowing me. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I think that's very common. Put that in the walk, man. Um, and I guess you you never uh you never came across a, a Metallica uh tape just laying in the grass like Manny did. Oh, huh? not in my neighborhood. Oh, it probably it's weird that he found one, but no, <laughs> yeah. <not> old, <laughs> <laughs> um. So, at what point did you go to like your first uh live show? I mean. I, I know there was a lot of music going around or in, in your neighborhood and things like that, but I guess your first live, you know, metal show or live rock show, you know, stadium show, or maybe at a club, wherever it was, like what would, where, where was it? And, and how old were you? Um, I think I was still a sophomore, sophomore, senior in high school still. Okay. And, uh, what show was it? yeah, Don, Don Murphy and, uh, we had a uh, a buddy he had introduced me who went to Spelman. I think he went to Spelman. His name was John Hyde. Uh real good kid. And he was into metal for sure. So I think that's how they met. And uh they introduced me and we all started hanging out together. And uh they used to go back back then they had metal shows down in Manhattan. Was it Manhattan? They had some in Manhattan. Um uh, Lamar was in Queens. Uh-huh. And uh they had shows about every Friday. No, it was when like big bands would show up. Well, big bands then would yeah, show sure. up. Every Friday, they'd be like something out. You know, you could go see Overkill on a Friday or something like that with some. So they they took me along one day, um, and I don't remember what we were going to see, but I don't. I remember our first show was a band called Mordred. Uh-huh. Um, then it was, I think it was Mordred. Mordred. It was either Death Angel or Suicidal Tendencies, and Overkill was headlining. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's a great show. Sounds like a yeah. great show. Yeah. Back then, it was just a show. You know, yeah. right now, it's like, oh, Suicidal. And, you know, back then, you know, it was just Suicidal. You know, they had to, the, 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 you know, and they, they just wanted a Pepsi. So you uh-huh. wanted to. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, but it was like, but but it, I don't think the... um. Will you laugh tomorrow was out yet? I'm not quite sure. Yeah. But but yeah, Mike Muir came up on stage and man, that was awesome. Mordred, we walked in, Mordred was already playing. And that was more mentally kind of like the singer was actually trying to sing. Yeah, you know? sure. Uh Suicidal came on, Mike Muir starts running around the stage. And I was like, whoa. I think that was the first time it's like, whoa, I want to be that dude. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, because most of that stuff, like stuff I'd seen in like videos and stuff, you know, the the, the vocalist is just sitting in front, and that they say Mike Muir's running around acting like a dipshit, or you know, <laughs> getting the crowd out, or, you know, cuckoo. I was like, man, yeah, that's pretty hardcore. And it wasn't they weren't like he didn't look like a metalhead. He kind of looked like us because we all are from like the streets, so we you know we weren't like. Although I think we had leather jackets at one point too. We we, yeah. we, we, start, we were starting to look like metalheads, but he looked like like the kids back on my, my block. Yeah, sure. So it was inspirational. Then Overkill came out, and it was. I always liked Overkill, but the the whole stage presence of like you know the big lights and smoke, and I was like, "Whoa, this is a big deal," you know. Yeah. And that's when I started thinking, I, I can do that. I want to be on the band, you know. Because I was never like a fan. I was never like a fanboy or just about anybody. You know, what I'm saying I was unimpressed. I was just like whatever. I just wanted to do it because it looked like a lot of fun. Yeah. So, so I think um, that was that was probably like the the first bug in my ear about wanting to be in a band. I see. Did you did you like go into the pit at all in that show? Oh, we were always in the pit. We were always, okay, getting, always in the pit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like the worst thing we we learned real quick. The le- the worst thing we could do is wear our expensive sneakers because they would just get so <laughs> trashed. You know. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I more black eyes and you can count, you know, and knots and this, that, and the other thing. But back then, there was no ninja stuff in the pit. You know, right now, it looks like okay. a, everybody's doing karate. It was just the old school, you know, you get into a circle, start throwing stuff around, throwing 
punches or whatever and a lot of floating and stuff the old school stuff yeah you know yeah, it sure. wasn't such a song and dance like it is these days for sure um so did you form like your first um uh first band if if you want to call it that um when you were in high school or was that after high school no that was with uh when i met don murphy And we started going into shows, and I wanted to learn guitar. So, so I think I went to Fordham Road. There was a pawn shop there. I just picked up a little BS guitar they had, not knowing anything about guitar. It came with the amp. Yeah. And uh, Don Murphy knew uh, a little bit of a uh, guitar. At least he knew how to tune it and play some power chords. So he showed me how to. I still don't know how to tune one, but he, he tuned it for me and he showed me some power chords, you know, and that's how you get that metal sound that, uh, and and had to chug the notes. And he started goofing around and stuff like that. And turned out he played drums. So he had a drum set in his living room, which he was, he lived on the second floor on uh, Valentine just past Fordham. Okay. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, he had he had a bunch of crackheads in his building, so nobody really complained about yeah. uh, the drum sound like during the day. So he just bang away all day. He drove his grandma crazy and his <laughs> mom. But yeah, that's what he did. He had a drum set in there, and uh, I eventually took my guitar in there, and we started making you know just basic riffs and stuff like that. And he would show me patterns and and stuff to play like that. Like Manny says, everybody learns how to play. Um smoke on the water and this that and the uh -huh. other thing i think the first song that we record, recorded was um for whom the bell tolls uh sure 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 and it's so easy it's like didn't didn't and we didn't do the, that part but you know just the open chord part you know? sure. so i could yell into the microphone we had a little and i could yell into the microphone in between the chords i couldn't play them at the same time but if i let them rung out then i could you know, yell the words out and, and uh -huh. stuff like that. Now it's the beginning of, and that was a lot of fun. You yeah. know, I wasn't thinking of grandeur or, you know, being on stage and it was just something to do. Did, did you all call yourselves anything at that point? Oh, uh, I think like, um, I think it was called above it all or something like that is when we started like that, that that's how that name came around and above it all was just the accumulation of, People just coming in to jam. Like I would play guitar sometimes, and my John Hyde, he'd come and yell into the mics, or Kevin would. And um, at this point, you know, we did that for a little bit, no shows or nothing like that. It was just just jam sessions, jam sessions and, and beers. You know, you get a couple uh -huh. of forties and, and just jam. Um, at that point, um, Lehman College started. You know, we graduated high school, we went to Lehman. That's when uh. I remember I had nothing to do in between classes, so I was just looking for something to do, and I ended up joining the Lehman College um, radio station. Aha. Uh -huh. And that's when, yeah, that's when I met Gary, Gary, Gary Muntley. Yeah, sure. Uh, that's when I met him. I was a, he had his own little radio show there, and I was an intern, you know, and he would play it was like one or two DJs would play metal. So I would just listen to while I'm rearranging records and doing the intern stuff and stuff like that. And there was a kid named John Sanchez that was an intern too. And um, he'd come and jam with whatever above it all was. He'd do some vocals and this stuff like that. And he was like, and um, I think we were just talking one time. And I don't know how it came about, but Gary started hanging out with us and we go to, we we he'd meet us at my house, right? And then yeah. we had one of the shopping carts things where you go do the groceries, you uh -huh. know, these little carts. We fill that up with guitars, go through all my neighborhood, all the way to Fordham Road from one ninety six all the way down to to well one ninety eight all the way down to Fordham Road to, and it would amps and speakers and guitars <laughs> sticking out of this shopping cart thing to Don's house, and 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 we jam there. And wow. So that's how I know Gary. That's yeah, we were and I think he I think he was playing bass at the time. I don't know if it was basic guitar because he was showing me stuff on the guitar too. He was the, the more experienced of, of of all of us, really. I see. Um and did you 
were you working at the radio station when um they put on like the requiem show and yeah the big show the big yeah, pivotal yeah. historical everybody hung out and probably banged in the pit together and didn't know about it huh that's right yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was working at the radio station. I was one of the interns in charge with uh, helping set it up. Like Gary knew a lot of the people. So we'd uh, basically be Gary's little minions. You know, he'd be set this up and we'd go do set this up and do the gate and and stuff like that. I think he knew Romeo from Requiem, one of the Romeos. And uh, so he had contacts with them. So we'd meet the bands outside and escort them in and show them how to come in and stuff like that. And that that was pretty intense. That was like my first show that was like right in my face, like not on stage watching it like a professional band. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like, because that's what I was waiting. I thought the show was going to be, you know, just like, but it was just them on the floor, you know, playing. And I say, like, man, this is super doable. You know, it doesn't take much. Yeah. To, to do something like that. Do you remember who else was at the show? Um, we're in direct William. I think I remember Motley saying smoke screen, maybe they're like, That's right. and who, yeah. who else think? I don't, I don't. It's very smoke screen. Yeah. My memory doesn't go back that far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, that's fine. That's fine. Um, Was that the first like show in the Bronx that you went to? Oh uh, yeah. I'd have to say definitely. Yeah. 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 It was um, weird. I mean, where are we going to have a show? There's like no clubs. Cause that was my concept when they were bringing up the, the show idea. Yeah. And then it was like in the cafeteria, I was like, well, this, this might be lame, but I was actually really cool. Yeah. You know, that was my wow. first experience with that whole life style, I guess, just metal music and stuff. And at what point did you meet Shane? Because I know Shane is very pivotal for, you know, later on with Driven by Hatred and um, right and all. But was he was he in the mix at, at this point or is that later on? No, that's later on. Okay, that's later mm -hmm. on. And what yeah. about Manny? Did had you met him at this point? No, no, okay. not later. Okay. We probably maybe we all saw each other at that yeah. show, not knowing, you know. But yeah. no. Um. So, so where did you go as far as as you know, uh, playing with these guys, uh, from this point on? Like, how did you all develop further and what did it develop into? Um, It didn't develop into anything. It was just guys jamming. Yeah. And eventually, you know, we I stopped going to college. Uh, I had to go to work because the financial aid went down. The prices went up. So I had to leave college and go to work and started working construction and uh, adult life started, yeah. you know, time yeah. to pay the bills. <laughs> For sure, for sure. Um, and like, were you were you playing with anyone between then and when um, digression started? Um, uh, no, no. I was just twinkling on my guitar. I mean, me and Don were always friends. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I knew, you know, we'd hang out and you know just party. We wouldn't even play music, you know, just cracking forties here and there. And, and we we were going to shows quite often, you know. So now we were pretty much full blown metal heads, you know. We were, we were growing our hair out and leather jackets and and and, and that decadent lifestyle type type thing, yeah. you know. Sure. Um, sure. And I had a cousin Vanessa, and uh, her family used to come over every Sunday, you know. And I guess Vanessa was friends with Shane and or uh, with a, a Shane and a friend. I don't forget. I don't remember her name, but I don't know. Shane showed up in my house with Vanessa one day on a Sunday. Uh, and we were there all watching uh, television and, and stuff. And uh, he noticed there was a guitar in in the corner, just sitting there with the guitar Don had shown me. And he said, you yeah. play guitar? And I was like, no, nah, I try. You know what I'm saying? A little, a little, little something, something. And I, I could play little power chords and stuff like that, you know, and yeah. and some thrashy stuff. And then um, they say, I think you mentioned he played in a band, which ended up being Regression, whatever. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if it was right then and there or day two passed or something. He got in contact with us. 
and uh, asked if we wanted to come down and just jam and just play. And, and that was that. I played a couple. I met Scott, Jay. Jay was the drummer. Uh, Scott Marshall was the, the singer. Manny was, I met Manny. Uh, <laughs> Manny in his little bass. He had this little tiny bass and like a right. really like an overgrown violin. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> um and and i just jammed guitar i mean it wasn't like a tryout per se because there was like nobody else to like compete with it was just a hey, jam and stuff like that and i can i can keep up with the riffs that were simple enough for me to keep up with but yeah and what 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 kind of like sound did the digre- the digression have um when you came in what they sound like that was the thing. You had some, it was like four songs that we played over and over and over and over. And we yeah. just couldn't think of something. And they were all different. There was like slow melodic stuff. There was like a thrash song. It was like a more punky song, maybe. And it was just never ending. These songs were just like, like Metallica's ballads type 10, you know? <laughs> <laughs> dragon, dragon. Um, it was good for practice, but it was never going. It was just, I don't know. The chemistry wasn't there to actually grow stuff. I see. I see. And from what I remember when we talked a little bit ago, you brought a song in that you and Donald and Gary had developed, I think. Is that right? Right. Yeah. I think Donald at this point was showing up for practices. Okay. Like, okay. okay. He's hanging out and stuff because he liked the music and he was jamming. Yeah. And I think in this one particular night, um, Jay couldn't come for some reason. So Don just volunteered to play drums. And we played our songs and then we took a break. And in between the break, um, I just started playing You Know I Know, like on the guitar. Yeah. And it it just basically, it was real simple. It was a song that was ripped off from uh, uh, Dark, I think it was. The Philippine guys, what was it? Oh, uh, Death Angel. Yeah, yeah, Death Angel. Yeah. It was like, um, I don't know if it was on board or, but basically the riff went, dun, 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 dun. it was something like that, you know, yeah. and we started, jam- and I just started jamming while we were practicing. And I was like, oh man, there it was like really nodding their heads. So Shane was like, picked up the guitar and he was like, no, oh, this is a simple riff, you know? So Shane starts playing the riff with Don and it's jamming. So I pick up the mic and I start, doing the vocals to it and everybody just kind of looked at each other and it was like oh shit you know that worked that had tons of energy if you hear the song it has of energy in its raw form it's yeah. just yeah, it's just it's just a powerhouse little two verse song <laughs> you know Shay made it beautiful uh with its with its talent as as the band progressed and like redid it and made it into a masterpiece but um yeah and that's how we all kind of looked at each other and then we were like, man, this is so much better than digression or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, we used to all meet up at this uh, bar on Kings Bridge Road. I forgot what the name of it was. And we kind of talked to each other and we were like, you know, we went to the normal White Castle and we were talking some more and we determined that uh, a new band order, new order of the band, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think I think we all quit the band, and we told Scott, you know, and Jay that we were quitting the band. And ten seconds later, we formed our own band or something like that. You know, it was like the, the politest way to say, you know, we, you know, we want to do our own thing. Sure, yeah. sure. It was a terrible moment, you know. It was just because we're all friends, you know, and it's like, yeah. man, some things are hard, but it worked out in the end. They were really good about it. Um. And did you all have, you know, the name driven by hatred in mind at this point? Or how did no. that develop? Me, me and me and uh Shane were uh, talking on the phone. And this is when the phones had cords. Yeah. You know. So, um and we were like, what the hell are we gonna call it? We were like, this, that, the other thing. I say, like, Well, what what are we? Oh our music is aggressive and we hate shit. But we don't see it's it's kind of a play on words because it's like driven by hatred, like we hate everything. It's actually hating the fact that we hate all this other crap 
that makes you hate. Uh-huh, you know, uh-huh. all the negativity is what we hate. It was, yeah. If the world was peace and love, then it'd be a, a, a lot better. But it's not like that. It's all the negativity that we hate. Yeah, you know, sure. all the negative experiences is what we hate. That's what was driving us. You know, all this crap getting robbed. You know, I've been robbed at gunpoint like five, six times already. You know, it's like all this shit and seeing people get killed and stabbed and you know bloody streets and this, that, and the other thing in our neighborhoods. It's like that's all the stuff that we hate. You know, why yeah. why can't we just do what we do or be who we are? And uh, everybody just dig it. You know, I mean together. So, so that was the name behind Driven by Hatred. And um, we find it with that. And how would you like describe the uh the difference in sound between like driven by hatred and you know other things you were playing in the past? I, I think you hinted at it a little already, but to, to talk a little bit more about like the sound of driven by hatred, what made it like unique? I think it was just punching in the face music. Yeah. But it wasn't the yeah, crucial chaos four on five, you know, on two or three chords, punk rock just yelling, you know, yeah. repeating the same chords, you know, yeah, that, sure. type of, that type of punk type style. Yeah. Shane was an incredible, oh, Shane always has been. <laughs> I said it like he was past tense. It was yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. He always has been a, an incredible guitarist. And man, he was really learning, he was really um, putting into it on learning on bass. And Don was just drumming for like ever. So yeah. the music, they all, everybody just clicked. I mean, I to this day, I think the weakest musician, I mean, weakest link of the whole band was me, you know, because I was angry enough to, and I was angry enough to get the vocals and stuff out. And it wasn't a deep roaring vocals. It was almost kind of a, I guess what the genre these days would be like a crossover hardcore. Like yeah, a sure. crossover. Uh, a lot of the inspiration came from like leeway and and bands like that you know and there was no guttural it wasn't like high pitched like malik from rights reserve yeah sure uh, if you ever heard right reserve back in the day malik was his voice was a lot like jd's from hellbound yeah yeah, yeah 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 really high pitch you know i uh, if i do that i my intestines would blow out and i'd be bleeding out all over the place you know for my vocals <laughs> And it wasn't it wasn't so much like uh, deep and guttural like Phil's vocals, like Phil's yeah. and uh, and read. Martin vocals, you know. Yeah, sure. They just they just sound like giant big warlords, you know. It's like the yeah. all yeah. doom and fear. So we were kind of a mix in between that. Huh. I think I think what I brought to the table was my energy, yeah, and my st- uh, the stage presence, because I always thought that Mike Muir had the best stage presence, you know. So I didn't want to be standing anywhere for too long on on stage, you know. And that yeah. was almost like that was almost translating energy wise, crowd wise. You you start moving around on stage and getting people's space from on stage, and they'd respond to it. And sure. it was almost like if I was playing an instrument, you know, which is my attitude, you know. If you Absolutely. sit there and do nothing, you put everybody to sleep. If you got in and brought everybody in, so everybody wanted to be. If you made everybody the band, then everybody partook and enjoyed it so much better. You know, and I think, I think I, you know, since I was like the weakest thing, I couldn't sing. You know, uh, it's 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 called being vocalist forever, but I couldn't sing or else I'd be in a rock band making six digits a month. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I would have um, been rich and dirty if I could be Bon Jovi and sing, you know. It's like I couldn't do that, you know. So I just did my attitudes and you know just approached everything pissed off and in a good way, you know, and just embraced everybody. Absolutely. Um, and I think you're I think you're selling yourself short a little bit because uh, in in Manny's oral history, he also talked about what a like an amazing lyricist um, you are and. Uh, and I know, you know, like Concrete Jungle, for instance, um, mm. you know, there's some really uh, like, yeah, some some really spectacular lyrics uh, just as far mm. as, you know, like summing up a whole kind of um, experience and like time in the Bronx and all. Um, right. So why don't you talk a little bit about like how you wrote lyrics, some of some of the mm. like songs that still stick with you if you want to talk about concrete jungle that'd be cool too because it's just like 
right, literally right down the road, Williamsbridge Oval Park. Um, yeah, for Park we'll go there for you. yeah, but you know, now that you brought it up, I was thinking the first thing you mentioned that it was like my the way I write lyrics, and the first thing that jumped in my head was standing on top, uh, back on Monroe Avenue on, on the uh, fire escape, looking at my dad, listening to Pedro Navaja and stuff like that in Spanish. You ever heard that song? Um, it's by um Ruben Blades. Where it's a salsa song and he's telling a story. Yep. And and a lot of salsa songs are like that. They tell a story. Now right. I wonder if that has any influence on how I write. Because I just write stories of the stuff that I did, saw, or you know, a lot of times I'd write to guys, well, you know, tell me a story about like um I don't know if he wants me to put it out there now, but you know, I'd ask Shane, you know what, you know, what could he Shane would write a song and uh I always felt like the chords needed to the music needed to go with the story yeah. almost in the way the music needs to go like in the movie soundtrack, you know, it yeah. needs to, the the vocals need to set the story and then the music and enhances that and, and, and paints the emotional picture behind that, you yeah. know, cause I could tell, I could tell the story of Concrete Jungle and it just sounds like, you know, somebody clapping off a gun to get out of trouble, but you yeah, put sure. the music behind it and it becomes more intense. You know, so I'd ask the guys, you know, you wrote this this song. What were you thinking when you wrote it? You know, and some like you know, one was a story about Shane's dad and the stuff he was going through. You know, we wrote a story, story about that, you know, and it just bring everybody just, you know, and everybody just gets into it because it's part of their actual experience. It's not like a four or five guys on stage pretending to be something they're not, you know. If you can, back in the day, there was a saying in the hardcore, keep it real, you yeah. know, and that's what we did. Uh, that's what we tried to do and just keep it, you know. That's why I can't be a vocalist now, because I'm not pissed off about nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing to write about, nothing, nothing I want to write about, you know. I, I don't need to get anything off my chest. Yeah, sure. You know, I'd be, I'd be making shit up. If, I'm sure I could find something, but it wouldn't be productive, you yeah. know. Because we didn't yeah. want to put a message of, like, even though it was called Driven by Hatred, but like I said, it was it was more than just a band. It was more of painting a, a positive note in a way that everybody's into this aggression. If we can reach those people and paint the positive note and everybody can come together. You know, you go to a, a Driven by Hatred show, it wasn't about the band. It was about the community, the people that came to the shows. It was about It was about the scene. You know, it was just an excuse for everybody to get together. And that's the way we thought about it, you know? Yeah. It wasn't about we're going to be big shit. You know, it's, it's it's just, it was just an excuse for everybody to get together and jam and, and share thoughts and ideas and, and, and music and stuff and have a good time in, in a safe environment. And, you know, how many men are to do that in New York and we can't just all chill out in the corner. We'll start a riot with somebody, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. Well, where where was Driven by Hatred's first show? Do you remember? Uh, Driven by Hatred's first show had to be the train depot. At the train depot? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you remember yeah. um, other bands that might have played with you at that show or other times at Train Depot? Well, this was the first Train Depot show was like I'm Manny had alluded to this. It was just a little cafe looking thing. Yeah. And um it, we had no speakers. We were playing through our, our my my car's house speak my car speakers through through one head, and we had the drum set. And this just happened to be the same night. Um, like they had the TVs for the bar and stuff like that over the bar. Uh, uh -huh. OJ was making his run down the highway uh -huh. <laughs> in his uh -huh. car. You know? So I had a whole crowd going, OJ, go OJ, go go OJ. I remember I remember that night. That was pretty cool. I was so sick as a dog. I had like um. I I was so sick. I had like two shots of NyQuil and then yeah. I got to the bar and I pounded down like three shots of ghost lager on top of the NyQuil. <laughs> I was so messed up that day. It was like it was it was a good time. It got I got me over the nerves and stuff, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, I, just, I, just, I just looked it up real quick. I guess June 17th, 1994. That must have been that must right, have been okay. it. When the chase right. was, was happening. Right. That show was crazy. I used to, I had gotten my tooth. I don't, I don't believe I'm going to tell the whole world this, but because the only one who knows this is Shane. Well, the guys knew about it afterwards, right? But yeah. 
but I move a lot on stage. There wasn't a lot of stage, but I had gotten my tooth knocked out a while back, right? So I had this like the plastic one that you put in to, to right. I was so out of it that somewhere along the line, I took the mic and I hit my mouth, and that tooth fell out on stage. And a lot of jumping around is me trying to find the damn tooth. Uh, <laughs> this, it, it was almost like that pirate in the Pirates of the Caribbean when he tries to find his eyeball and he just keeps rolling yeah. around. And man, it kicks it one way and Shane kicks it the other way. And everybody's fucking loving it because they think I'm jumping around crazy. And no, that was it. <laughs> Looking for your tooth. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there's some transparency there for you guys. That's funny. That's funny. Uh, and what are some of the other places that you played at, like at that stage, um, as it, of Driven by Hatred's history goes? Oh, we played about everywhere. Somewhere along the line, um, because Manny had mentioned, you know, we had Scott Brick doing shows for us. Uh -huh. Um, so he had to play, he had us playing everywhere. And, you know, at the time, like, I didn't really listen to like other hardcore bands, yeah. you know, because I, I didn't want to be influenced by a lot of other people. I wanted yeah, to sure. keep what I was doing pure. But, uh, I don't know, I can't remember. I know we were playing just about everywhere we could get a gig is where we went yeah you know, playing uh, we figured the more experience and the tighter we got the better we were going to be do you do you have very many memories from like the blue frog um that was a, that was a good show yeah, that was yeah. yeah that was the one we were met um frankie and the gormentis guys and a bunch of other dudes yeah yeah, yeah. i remember um, we were supposed to go in early and then they put us in headlining last that was like that was my first the first time I was like, man, I don't want to headline the show. We get to play last, <laughs> you know. I'm already sleeping. Yeah, yeah but <laughs> um, and what about like um? Do you have very many memories of like house or backyard shows around the yeah. Bronx? The the BDC shows were a lot of backyard shows everywhere from like um. Oh, who was the uh, guitarist for um? Uh, Rights Reserve. Um, oh, Malik was, was, it, um, was it? Well, let's see. Alex was in Rights Reserve. Who else was in Rights Reserve? Leon. 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 Oh, Leon. Was yep. Leon. Yeah, he played an SG Gibson Red. I remember his guitar. Yeah, we used to go to his house, and he had backyard parties. I think everybody in the BGC had a backyard party. But I think uh, the one okay. you're alluding to is that uh, our age first show. Oh yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. When they misspelled their name, I, I think it was something. I think everybody <laughs> points that. <laughs> That's right. They do. Yeah. They do. Yeah. But if I remember right, that was Malik's friend's, Malik's friend's girlfriend's party or something like that. And okay. it was the last minute thing. I think we had just come out from rehearsal or something to practice, and they said, "Oh, there's a party going on. You guys want to play?" And so we just decided, "Yeah, let's just all since we got all our shit here, we just go play," you know, yeah. at this late birthday. And we played that show, and that that is that show was important to me because that was the the show that uh oh the backyard party where uh Shane <laughs> Shane I guess it was all nervous. He asked me if he can go out with my cousin Vanessa, and they ended up getting married and had a beautiful child and stuff like that. Wow. But that was that was the first time, and like like if I didn't know they weren't together or something like that, I I should have played it off like I was like mad and knowing just to mess with him, but you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh no we could yeah that's what i remember most about that show i mean the show was great i remember the power went out towards the end but everybody got their their set in yeah yeah the, the irate guys killed it as always you know and it was like um it was what, good times. what about other other venues like around new york city um would you all play castle heights some of the other ones that were big around Hyde, kevin, kevin from castle heights was always good to us you know um we used to there was this other there was um it was kevin nikki camp was booking shows and uh this other lady and uh we were just playing so many shows everywhere every time they had a cancellation they'd call us up we'd just jump in the car and then we'd go now we were playing shows without drummer you know just jamming without the drummer and people were loving wow. it because the drummer couldn't get there at you know last minute you know I so see. So they can count on us. But back in the day, it was difficult because none of the, well, at least we weren't making any money. 
Yeah. Because all, all the clubs work. Uh, you you got a dollar, one or two dollars for every person that would come to see your band. So for the whole show, you had to have somebody say, "Oh, we're coming to see Drum by Hate You," you know, and they'd make a slash, and that was two dollars you'd get yeah. for that. So the the show could be packed, you know, but since there's like five shows and there, you know, and everybody would like kind of divvy it up, kind of, you know. So it was hard. It wasn't no longer making money. It was a lot of spending money more than anything else. Yeah. You know, it was, there was no internet back then. They passed AOL. So the mailing list, the mailing list was you, you'd get the cutest girl you could find to go around asking people for their address uh, or their number and address and stuff like that. So you can actually physically mail, mail them a flyer, you yeah. know? So you'd have to spend money on getting post apps for like 50 flyers and, and stuff like that to get to go out to announce a show you know times are wow. different times are a lot harder absolutely um would you, did you all have to rent like studio space or not uh, you know rehearsal space did you all have rehearsal space that you did uh yeah we had rehearsal spaces in like chango chango was the let us out to the blue frogs and then they had music unlimited and i think there was another one um before that too but yeah, so yeah. yeah, it was like ten dollars an hour, fifteen dollars an hour, you know. And then we met this one lady who let us practice in the basement. You know, she she dug the music. That's right. And then the family. I, Mandy mentioned that. You know, I was yeah. I was wondering where they ended up, how they ended up. It'd be nice to catch up with them. But they let us practice for free, you know, and that's where we got tight. You know, and we had other players come in. I think uh, we, we should have some honorable mentions for. The DBH lineup, you know. Yeah, sure. We had uh, Jimmy and Jim Jimmy Ortiz played guitar with us for a little bit. Um, we had Crazy Eddie, I think, play a show with us, you know. Um, I think even Vinny and Fish uh, had some practices with us. I don't know if they actually got to play with us, but you know, we tried wow. a bunch of different things. I think Fish was actually playing keyboards at the time. You know? Wow. And then we had like um. Um, like Vincent, Vincent, uh, Vincent Kearney, I think his name. Sorry, Vincent, if I messed that up. But Vincent was a fan, and he loved it. He came to every single show. He was like the, the, the extra member. Like he was just always wow. there. So he'd come hang out with us. He'd be backstage. He'd do everything. You know, so he deserves an honorable mention for uh, supporting us and stuff like that, as well as everybody who did come to see us. You know, a lot of times it was hard because you know we're, we're playing so much, or they just came. You know, you got a one BDC band playing on a Saturday, one on a Friday, and one on a Sunday. You know, it's hard to divvy all those bands up, so it gets hard. Yeah. It gets expensive. You know, you can't be everywhere. You know, sure. Yeah, there was a lot of nights when you know you're just playing to your family and a couple of friends, or maybe just nobody at all. You know, the club owner. But yeah, you know, um, it's it's humbling. So, uh. I want to ask you a lot more about BDC in a second. Um, before I do that, though, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about like the Blackthorn? I know that the two are probably overlapping a lot, but um, playing shows at the Blackthorn. Oh, the Blackthorn was cool. That was a Nicky Camp thing. Yeah, he he got and he actually made a a big stage and stuff like that. And we had some some pretty intense shows there because it was bigger. It had a big stage. It was easy, like accessible because it was a, a train that stopped there. It was a train stop, the bus stop, you know, you could drive there with some decent parking. So it was pretty well thought out. Um, we had some big shows. I can't remember everybody we played with there, but it, it was definitely uh, a good time. There's a lot of videos of the Blackthorn shows. There are, as, yeah, yeah. as well as the, the second version of the train depot, because they had eventually built a, a big stage. Like We played with like Nuclear Salt and, and some other bands there and you know, they, they were getting some big gigs and they were putting money into getting big bands coming down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And were there, before we get into the BDC, um, were there other, any other like places around the Bronx that you played? I mean, you know, there's obviously people's backyards, uh, mm -hmm. the Blue Frog, the, the Train Depot, the Blackthorn, any others that you remember around the Bronx? Do you remember playing some place down by the water? Uh, it was towards the east. It was a, a bar club. We played there a couple times. And it was just playing on the floor in the back room. I don't remember the name of it. 
but it was like where they're almost towards City Island, kind of. Oh, interesting, huh? Yeah, it was like you, you'd park and uh. And and there'd be some older guys and metalheads and stuff like that eventually coming up. Yeah. I remember somebody coming. I was like after the show. It was like <laughs> he he was outside and he thought Sepultura was playing inside. It was us. I guess we sound. I kind of sounded like that a little sometimes. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I came inside, called all my friends, you know, on the phone. And they all came down. He <laughs> caught your show. So we were <laughs> making. So that was the show. That was that was a place to play. Um, outside of that. We, I don't think so. I think those are the major. Yeah, sure. Um, there were some public parks where they had some public open shows, you know. And uh, my big thing was getting the, the new bands to play. Like, if you had a brand new band, I would just totally ask you to, if you wanted to open up just for exposure. The more people, the better. Yeah, you know? sure. It wasn't like you had to try. Oh, and um, uh, Hellbent. Uh, we met the guys from Hellbent, and they were like a, a rock band. And uh they got a gig at I forget where the first one. It was probably the Dole Down. Up on uh, what is it, New Rochelle or something like that? Yeah, uh, Mount Ver I think Mount Vernon, but Mount yeah. Vernon, yeah. Yeah. So they had a show up there and they came down to one practice to see if we were actually a band or just making noise. Yeah, uh, I remember the, the bassist he said, We just want to hear if you guys got that chun 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 sound. <laughs> you know, we actually had songs. Yeah, so we got a gig with them, and uh, then they scored a gig being the house band for that club. Oh, okay, okay, wow. Right, and and then they had open nights like on Thursdays where a band could come in and play like four songs. Yeah, you know, any band. So we would jump on that all the time just to get practice and exposure and try out new songs. And you know, this song nobody likes this song. Everybody liked this song. You know, we we have the girls watch. You know, who's not in their song head to this song on this part, and then maybe not so much on this part. So we get rid of the part where they weren't nodding and fill it in with something out. You know, yeah, kind of hit it scientifically, I guess, if you will. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Hell, hell bent, right? Because obviously yeah, hell there's bent. hell bound, uh, a part of you know in and out of the BDC too. But this is hell bent. Right. No yeah. Manny Manny too. Um, yeah, they were like a rock band, and yeah. they had an incredible singer, John. He was a super dude and uh, incredible bassist, drummer, guitarist. They were all like, if we were a five musician wise, they were like nine or ten compared to us, wow. you know. Wow. So then they took us to the wing. We learned a lot, and you know, how to set up the drums, how to tune the drums to the guitars. Because nobody thinks of that. You know, you get a drum set and you start whacking away. Yeah, and, sure, sure. You know, the guitars not tuned, they are always tuned to each other, but are they tuned actually close to the bass or are they close to the bass drum? Is the bass tuned to the bass drum, you know? And yeah. that all gets it that 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 thumping sound, you know, when everything's working. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um and are there any like I know you all played a ton of shows, but are there any shows that like stick out to you as like you know the most memorable or the craziest or you know whatever it might be um any shows that like are at the top of your memory um i like the blue frog show even yeah. though i don't remember i remember because i was a leeway fan and i look over and there's eddie something i think is there moshing around <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, was like, uh -huh. I was like wow that's pretty cool that is cool it, it wasn't his happy time you know he was going through a lot of stuff uh, at yeah. that time he was like kind of messed up but he was he dug us um i usually enjoyed the shows where i was enjoying the band we were opening for so i could yeah. see it for free you know yeah, <laughs> we sure. played we played with clutch because at the, you know i like the, the stoner music and stuff like that and yeah. so we played with clutch and that was cool because we got to see him for free up close you know and yeah. there were tons of hardcore bands it was just uh, I can't remember anything, everything. It, it wasn't so much the show as much as the crowd and the people. Sure, is sure. Where I wanted to see. I, I was that guy, you know? Absolutely. If I, could sing, if I could sing from the floor, I'd sing from the floor if I could. But I, <laughs> I never wanted to be that guy that was that had people, like, looking up to you or something like that, you know? Yeah. Say like people for autographs and stuff like, oh, man, you, you're killing me. Let me buy you a beer and shit like that, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> It's all on it, you know.
I'll give you a free um, tape. If you're would, uh, did, did DBH play like outside of New York City at all? Like, you know, upstate or Pennsylvania, anything like that? Jersey, Jersey Long Island, yeah. stuff like that. Um, and not, how, not crazy, I remember. how, how were y'all received, like, you know, outside of the Bronx or outside of New York City? I've never been any place where they didn't like us. Yeah, yeah. I think we were yeah. in that sweet spot where you had the metalheads like us, you had the hardcore kids like us with the attitude, you had the, and then, you know, what we were saying with the truth and it come across. I mean, I've never had a bad driven by hatred show and they're like booed or something. And on the contrary, we'd start playing at an empty where it was like nothing but the bartender. And yeah. by our second song, the place was packed because everybody's outside. Like, what the fuck is going on there? What the hell is uh, that? Yeah, and that's thrilling. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then you have people yelling their songs and the whole club's singing their songs. And I mean, that's always intense. You know, uh, where I don't even have to sing. I'll give them the mic and let them do it. Yeah. You know? At the time... Yeah. At the, at the time, I used to drink a lot of beer. I don't drink at all, at all anymore. But man, it'd be people just giving me like, um, the mugs one at a time here to say beers and stuff like that. Everybody's buying me beer. The whole stage would be covered in, like, but the drum set riser, it's like, I was like, I can't possibly drink. All of this. <laughs> but I appreciate the sentiment, you know, that type of stuff. Yeah, so it was, wow. I can't pick out a, a driven by hatred show that would stand out more than another. Yeah. Uh, as long as long as it was a family, and when I say family, I mean the crowd. That that's what it was all about, and if everybody's having a good time, one thing I wouldn't tolerate was fights. And man, if there was a fight, I'd hit the brakes on something instantly, or if yeah. somebody got in, uh, in the pit, we'd hit the brakes on instantly. There was no keep on playing or something. Like that if I were to see somebody like hurting like in in the pit, like they got hit too hard or something like that, and took a knee or something like that, I'd stop the whole. I stopped the whole song. Wow. And the guy, I'd raise my hand, the guys would stop like that. On the next note, it was like, Kink! and it just goes silent. Wow. And so that's what we cared about. Wow. Um, and what about, like, um, recording with with Driven by Hatred? Did you all record um, demos and talk about that experience if you did? We recorded some goofy stuff at first. <laughs> 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 We had stuff with like weird sounds in it. It was like our first recording, like at, at one of the like Music Unlimited or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like good. And then like, uh, Frankie was playing at the time, though. So, you know, he had double bass and we were doing double bass here. And we had some effects on this and trying this out and stuff like that. And but and then we we did a couple compilations with other bands and stuff like that. And but right. we were tight. We were real. That's the only thing I, I can say about different. Um, Driven by head to, we were so tight. I mean, I, I, I'm not even afraid to put that on myself as, as a as a bragging right. Yeah. You know, so we practiced so much. We can knock out five songs in a two hour recording session. Wow. Right through it. I mean, from just playing the bass and the drums to not knocking out the guitars and throwing vocals on it. You know, so wow. we were always reaching, and it, and it was like nothing. You know, everybody knew exactly. You know. And Shane and Manny were so good at playing together, and everybody was so in tune that, say, Manny broke a, a bass string or something like that, right? Then yeah. Shane just played every note higher to match the the, ba the the string that was broken. Shane would match that on the guitar on the ones that Manny was playing. Wow. So it was and they just clicked that way, you know? Wow. Yeah, so it, it it was it was in, it was intense. I never had to worry about like what uh, a singer calls the back line, you know. Yeah, I mean, sure. These guys were a a one special forces, as far as I'm concerned. You know, that yeah. that was that was, that was the crew. They could do anything. Wow. They could do anything. If if I had an idea, a thought, a uh, um, a feeling, it was almost like they could read the feeling and just put that in in into music. And, and energy, you know, we're going to add energy here or this, that, and the other thing, and vice versa. Did everybody would talk to each other and it was like, it was pretty cool. So, recording was just, but recording for me was like, uh, it was yeah. like, you know, it was yeah. so bland. You could hear a GBH recording, oh, that's fucking cool, you know what I'm saying? But it was yeah. never, it was never as much energy as if you had a recording on video, you know, yeah. the energy, because it wasn't so much 
if you're listening to Driven by Hatred on on uh, on a tape, yeah, it's almost like you had to be there. It's like yeah, you sure. hear not to compare myself, but you hear Jimi Hendrix on tape. You know, that's some good guitar. You see him on live; that's a whole different vibe, a whole energy. You know, the energy of everything. You know, it's the whole experience. You know, Absolutely. the friends, family, everybody enjoying. That's what German Hatred shows are about. Absolutely. So, so I don't know where the recordings are. And I know there was a lot of good songs we worked really hard on for our next demo because we had we did we did some recordings and then we were working on like five or six songs that never got released. The band broke up before it was going to be Times Up. It was up was called. That was way before our time because it was so COVID era. Yeah. Um, it was so predicting the COVID era and government and this and that and the other thing. And it wow. was called Time Up. It's like if we keep and that was continuing with the driven by hatred theme, you know, if we keep sure. this bullshit up, we're just destroying ourselves. Nobody's gaining from this. Yeah. So the the thing it was it was gonna be uh like a, like the earth on, on a planet and like um uh something hitting it and like stuff going out into space and with like the I don't know, it was like a radioactive symbol or some shit like that. That the explosive symbol that, that it, and it was gonna be like neon uh typo ne- negative green or something like that. And that was wow. gonna be the yeah. And that's where we were heading, you know. We wanted wanted to put out a message, but man, we should get back together and, and do that stuff. Yeah. Do some road shit before I get too old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um so why don't you talk about talk some more about um uh, the BDC, how that came about, what it was, um, who all was involved in it, and all of that. Right. Yeah, and, and don't let me forget the the Concrete Jungle story for you. I don't want to cheat oh, you. Oh yeah, that. actually, yeah. Go go ahead and tell that first, and then we'll go back to the yeah. BDC. Yeah. Well, well mention uh, Manny had mentioned uh, the Concrete. That was one of our first songs. Yeah. Uh, it was very well received, but it came about uh, like you said, just on the block. It was me, Donald, and John Hyde, Donald, they played drums and stuff like that. And we were in the Oval one day, uh, one night, drinking uh, 40s right by, you know where the, the tunnel is on top? There's like a little bit of it. We were yep. just hanging on there. And across the street, I mean, the gates were closed. Across the street, um, this party came out. Uh, it, it must have been like a house party. And they came out in a violent I think there was a fight broke out in the party. And there was just hordes of people flying out of this building, throwing punches and wow. this, that. And it, was, it was, we were watching it and, you know, it was all hip hop and stuff like that, you know, and it was getting kind of crazy. Uh, probably a lot of drinking, a lot of adrenaline going on because it was not just two people fighting. It was turning into one of those people, things where your whole crew is fighting another whole crew and everybody's jumping uh-huh. in it's a big giant melee. And there's like 50, People, you know, the whole party, one of those house parties that everything, it was just nuts. <laughs> so I was, you know, and over here, it's just the three of us on top, you know, just watching on on the on elevated part of Oval Park, yeah. uh, uh, just above the gate. And we got long hair. At this point, I got long hair. You know, we all got long hair, leather jackets, and we just look like victims. It was just look like <laughs> So I, I don't know what caused it, but I'm pretty sure somebody had to say something and seen us up there. And they were going to come up. I got the feeling that they were going to come up and come after it. Because now everybody's fired up, you know. So they were going to yeah. come up. At the at the same time, at that time, I had gotten tired of getting robbed and shit. And so I was, yeah, I, sure. was I was carrying a gun for like ever, you yeah. know. And I had a 1911. And at, at this particular point, I, when 1911 was so heavy, it was pulling my pants down. So I wasn't wearing it this time. Yeah, sure. No. I just fucking, what, what, whatever happened, I got nervous and stuff like that. And I said, these guys are coming up. So I wanted, I didn't want to shoot at them. So I, I shot at the, the building, at the concrete wall. Yeah. And uh, I only shot one round. And it was a 32 short. It was like, it wasn't even loud. It was like a, yeah. a little Ivor Johnson that the trigger didn't work right. I had a rubber band holding, pulling. It was so ghetto. It was just like a, yeah. <laughs> I had a rubber band pulling the, the trigger back so it could recock itself, a little revolver. <laughs> And it was that, but when I walk, because it's about ten feet from where the, the the wall is, and where you can actually see over the top, yeah, and to see where the crowd was coming up. And when I went back, they were all gone. Everybody was gone. It was ghosts. Wow. So they must have heard the shot ring out, 
you know, even though it was at a wall and just, no, you know, now, now there's shots ringing out and I don't know, maybe they thought somebody from their crew was shooting at somebody, you know, within their fight, you know, and we just happened to interject that firearm sound. And I think that's what happened. They all panicked and they all scattered. And I was like, oh, shit. We, we looked at each other like, like that, that meme when that little yellow guy rolls his eyes and it's like, oh, shit. And we just kind of walked. <laughs> we just kind of walked our happy asses all the way to the back of the oval and just walked out one of those, jumped over the gate. And, and that's where Concrete Jungle started. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wow. So so the song's a little embellished. It says with the fury of buckshot. It wasn't it was pistol. Yeah, you know, sure, but sure. It, the, the pistol didn't rhyme right, so I threw it in the buckshot. Yeah. No. <laughs> like if no. I would carry the shotgun under my jacket, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> There's more, wow. more transparency there. <laughs> but wow. that was interesting. Wow. Um yeah, so no, that's a great story to to have recorded since uh, Manny just mentioned it in passing and now you gave the full full version that's great to have um uh are there are there other like backstories behind any of the other dbh songs that you know you want to share or you know that have stories like that um you know i know it was written and it was just uh i didn't know what to write about so i just wrote about living in the Bronx, living in New York. I think Manny alluded to, to lyrics. He started spitting out the lyrics. I was like, oh, shit, they did, he did remember them. It stuck with him, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like, what a great world you know I know. You know, for somebody looking out, this is the world we live in, and this is what we know. Yeah. Yeah, so that, and then um, there was there was some songs that were written about um, Shane's dad, uh, who had uh, an, an addiction problem. Sure, sure. And uh, like my my dad was a di- um, he was an alcoholic. Yeah, but um, he never wrote songs about him. Um, and it was just um, songs about us, like um, to the end. It's like you know, I'll, I'll, as, as friends, we all stay together to the end. And it was not so much the banding, but it was um for the whole for the whole scene, you know. Sure. You know, if we all stick to it, and it kind of, it kind of came true. I mean, thirty years down the line, or whatever it is, there's still people in that scene. You know, still the same people are doing it still. That's right. So till the end, you know, nobody's getting six digits out of it a month. <laughs> you know, as far as I know. So it wasn't for the money, but more till the end, for the love of of playing, and that's what that's what that's what I really enjoyed. Yeah. Well, so so yeah now now why don't you talk a little bit about the bdc the boogie down crew and how that came about and all well we have to go back to the early days yeah and 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 get a feel and a pulse for how it was back then um we had a lot of people with a lot of talent and not a lot of money and not a lot of equipment and times were really hard i mean i don't know how many Maybe one person, one or two people per band had vehicles where they can carry stuff around. Or drum sets is like you know everybody's borrowing drums. Um, yeah. I remember Jeannie, uh, Gigi, uh, she plays other other type of music, but uh, she was we went to her house one time and she was playing on buckets. Uh huh. No, uh-huh. she's an she's an incredible drummer now, yeah. uh, playing a different style. And uh, yeah, she was playing on buckets. So they had guitarists with a head, no amp. I mean, they had head, or they're playing through lunchboxes that you couldn't really play at the at the big clubs, you yeah, know, because sure. everybody had their lunchboxes. So, and everybody was so spread out, and a lot of people didn't really know each other, you know, like we knew of each other, but since it was hard because, like I said previously, the the, you know, you go in there and you get a dollar head or, or something like that for the band that, you know, come see you, you know? So we devised a plan. I was like, you know, what if we can, like, in the same way, like, the big bands is where I got the idea of the big bands to have a back line. And yeah. it's like the band comes on, the, the drum set's already set up, you know, they got to, all they got to do is plug into the heads and stuff like that. And, uh-huh. you know. And unless you're like metallic, you got your own shit, you know what I'm saying? But like yeah. the opening bands, they just switch out the band. And 
So I was like, maybe we can do something like that. And so we got together and we, um, I think, we got together with the other bands and we're like, oh, you know, if we all get together, we can bring different equipment. Like if somebody uh, volunteers to bring, because we had a drum set, Donna had a drum set. We bring right. the drum set, one person uh, brings one guitar, you know, the head and um, and uh, the speakers for the, and, and, you know, another band brings the bass one, you know, something like that. Then we can play all these shows and we don't have to carry so much crap, you yeah. know? And for the band, and that gives exposure to like the bands that, because I don't think, excuse me, I don't, I don't remember Rice Reserve having a drum set at all. Uh, I see or something uh, like that. You know, there was a uh, lot of bands that didn't have the stuff, yeah, you know, or they were unable to get it out or something like that. You know, it's like uh, that's why they were doing the yeah. A lot of the bands were doing the rehearsal stuff because uh -huh. the rehearsal. The rehearsal studios had the drum sets and all that. So they became a band in the rehearsal studios because they had all the uh, back line. But uh, if, if they were going to go play somewhere, it, they just had the guitars. You know? I see. I see. Yeah, I see. that's what it was. Now that I'm, it, now that it's coming back to me. So how are we going to get like Rice Reserve and all these other bands on our bill if, uh, you know, to get exposure stuff or even when they have shows we'll bring our stuff even if we're not playing we'll bring our stuff so they can play you yeah. know and that time and then it, the wasted was another one i think the wasted didn't have a drum set either. and they were a punk band they were kind of cool uh -huh. yeah yeah sure sure um so that's how that came across and then uh we got together i mean my house my living room uh it's got to be pictured somewhere Whereas like all these bands are in my living room, my mom's. We're watching wrestling shows, and we have we have BDC meetings at my house, but wow. we'd set up shows and and stuff like that. Because if say Driven by Hatred play on uh, on a Saturday and Rights Reserved played on a Friday or Irate played on a Sunday or something like that, you know, it'd be all spread out, and then the clubs would see like five people here, five people there, five people there, or something like that. If we all yeah. got together and we approached it as, as a group, say we're going to bring all our shit in, and we're going to bring all these people, and we all play it on one bill, then it'd be a giant, huge, huge crowd. The clubs would see that. Hopefully, they'd loosen up with some money, and uh, the huge crowd. And and you know, the bigger the crowd is, you know, word of mouth starts going out right? because that was important back then. Just word of mouth. I went to this show. This. Uh, you know, along with the, you know, we can't all afford to send out flyers and stuff like that. So word of mouth was important, you know. So that was like a big creative, like, I don't know if you call it a, uh, what would you call it? Not a mafia. <laughs> but, uh, you know, <laughs> but it was just one big giant, you know, one big giant thing. And all the bands knew each other and crew and we shared equipment and we shared transportation and uh, I mean, I remember not playing and carrying drums in for people and speakers. And, you know, we'd bring our, our stuff in. And, and I don't have a chip on my shoulder. I didn't, you know, yeah. we were nothing special. We'd go and hang out and set people up. And a lot of these bands that were newly coming up, they didn't have anything. So what were they supposed to be? You know, they wanted to start a band. They have three songs yeah. that they, they're they jamming in their bedroom with the little lunch boxes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Sure. I said, go, go, spend a couple of dollars, hash it out in the studio, and then uh, call me up when you're ready, and we'll let you open up and just play with all our shit. Just bring new and new guitars. Or if you don't even have a guitar that you think is worth, you know, play Shane's guitar. Shane will cough up a guitar, or Manny will cough up his bass. He don't, he don't care. You know? Wow. Yeah. So wow. That, that's what the Boogie Down crew is about. Wow. It's just a big unity thing. And, uh, is there is there any story at all, you know, behind the name of it? I mean, obviously, it's a common name, you know, common name for groups of people in the yeah. Bronx, the Boogie Down Crew. But but right. any backstory behind that at all? Oh, uh, we were just trying to find something catchy. Yeah. And uh, oh, who's who's the guy that has the Boogie? Is there, there's a rap? There's, ding, yeah, ding, Boogie ding. Down Productions, uh, KRS One, and I was hoping he wasn't going to get mad at us. <laughs> yeah, so I expected him to come to our shows. What the you know? What the hell are you doing? And, but uh, at the same time, he's from the Bronx. He's, I'm I'm pretty sure if he's you know seen, you know, Bronx kid trying to do something good, even if it's in a different way, he wouldn't mind it so much. We're not doing anything negative, you yeah, know. Yeah. If, even if he's not the you know the rap 
because we've had a show the 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 um the Blue Frog show. There was rap artists uh, showcasing there, and it was it's it was all a big mix. Yep. And yep. if if you listen to the way the um hardcore lyrics sometimes are are, are spit out, there are uh, you, you throw that on through a beat, it becomes a rap song. Absolutely. You know. You know, it's, as they say now, it's got bars and stuff. It's yep. just in, in, in a different form. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, K- KRS-One used to be on the same bill as Sick of It All, at least for a little bit, you know? Right. Uh, and, yeah, anyway, there's that, that whole history of the genres having a very close relationship for right. a little and bit. Right, and it's inevitable, you know? We are in a, the home of hip-hop, you know? And it's just... Right. A progression from you know they That's say right. rock and roll started from the blues yep so from out from hip-hop came you know mixed it with punk and then you get new york hardcore new york deathcore some crossover yep. you know if you if you sing like phil and and you sound like you're 30 feet tall giant gonna stomp you then it becomes a like death chorus you know <laughs> that's right that's right like if you sing like me it's kind of a, like a crossover yeah yeah that's right um so what 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 all bands from what you remember were were down with the bdc i remember it was us go to mentis um uh, irate uh rights reserved the wasted um hellbound for a little while would come in back and forth yeah um I think Sudden Fear was like the farthest one out. I think they were from Long Island. Oh, I, think were, yeah. I think they were death metal. But I remember they were coming out all the way to my house. If I, wow. if, I mean, Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I'm pretty sure it was there. Yeah, no, it, I, um, you mentioned them to me before, yeah. Because um, they invited us for a show down there, and it was a pretty cool show. Wow. I remember we went to the U-Haul. We had the equipment and all our fans inside the back of the U <laughs> along with the band. <laughs> it was a cold night too. They were freezing their asses off. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, oh, I guess blackout too, right? It was blackout. Oh, yeah. Blackout. 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 Yeah. blackout, rights reserved. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and let me see. Oh, I think there's another one from out of the Bronx. East Wing, is that right? East Wing, something like that? East Wing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, East yeah. Wing, yeah. They were very rock and rolly. Oh yeah, not, not to be rock and roll. I see. I don't care if you were playing music yeah. and you had a good time and you were good people. Then we we hurt you up. Not that, that was, they needed any help. Out. They had I, they had all kinds of cool equipment and wow. they, they had smoke machines and stuff. The whole rock and roll thing. It was fun to watch. You know, so even though it started in the Bronx, it obviously grew beyond the Bronx, and you know started becoming a little bit of a wider thing, I guess. Is that right? Well, people were getting BDC tattoos on their arms. Yeah. So then they were in it, you know? I think I think Phil and Nando both have BDC tattoos. Right on. I know Frankie does. Yeah, yeah. Right? And it was, I mean, and that's that was the name of it, the the spirit of it. It was what the great, great thing, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you go to one level and if you can pick up the people that are under you trying to get to that level without you head get, you know, without getting blown out of proportion, you know, and then if you can pick people up and do good things, that was the whole spirit of the BDC. Absolutely. And that's I think that's probably what kept the, the crews together. Because everybody learned from that experience. And I'm sure our rate has hooked up a thousand bands in 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 in, in that. In, in in that way, you know, in that loving, caring, looking out for the, the younger guys. I'm sure Billy Club and all the other bands and Gordon have hooked up a thousand new guys coming up in, in that manner. And I think yeah. it all stemmed from the love we all gave each other. Yeah. Um. So, uh, did you? I've I've I actually have a a copy that um Barry Gordon uh gave me but were you involved in the bdc zine i think it's just one issue that ever came out but were you involved in the zine at all no i don't think so at least i don't remember yeah, yeah. I'll, I I'll, I'll, I'll i'll send you a copy think, yeah that'd be great i'd like to see yeah i i know ramon ramon go and i think a couple others were but there's a zine um right. you know bdc zine that's really interesting um but uh but yeah, Damn, that's old school. 
Yeah, 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 for yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, I miss so, Ramona. I heard his name in a long time. Yeah, no, he's 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 good. Yeah, he's good. Uh yeah, yeah still still at it. Um you know, Coda Mintas just put out that 30th anniversary um little compilation. Um but, I watched uh, it, uh, the goat show. Uh, a shout yeah. out to the goat show, Barry. That's right. That's right. That's right. Shout out to Barry for sure. <laughs> uh, so why don't you talk about um like the end of Driven by Hatred and the end of the BDC? I don't know if those two like you know coincided at all or you know what the timeline was for that, but the end of the BDC and the end of Driven by Hatred. You know, I in all honesty, I can't even I don't know if I can speak to that much because I don't even remember why we broke up. Yeah, 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 yeah. We probably just started all going our different ways. People started going to work. You know, I, was, yep. I think he was working for United UPS at the time, working the night shift, loading trucks, uh, you know, and it was just getting drawn out. And it was become, I think it became more work than it was fun. And once, one thing's become work, you know, I was kind of disheartened too, because we got, I, I, I think we, if I remember right, we were talking about a record deal with, with somebody. And I had met Pete Steele at the at the limelight, we bullshit, you know, it's PC from typo. Yeah, sure. And we were bullshitting and he was trying to hook up he, he was trying to hook me up with the bartender, but we were bullshitting. I was telling him, you know, you guys got a following in the Bronx. And he didn't believe me. He's like the Bronx is all hip hop and bullshit. But he was telling me we we kind of got into it and in not I mean in in a, in a good way, but he was telling me to be careful because uh a lot of the problems that he was in stem from like the the record company, um, they sign you on, right? They, yeah. they give you all these promises, but now you're on the hook for seven albums. Uh -huh. Then now you have to put out seven albums. Well, all these seven albums got to put out a certain amount of money. They got to sell, yeah. right? And they give you up up upfront cash stuff that you got. You think it's yours, and they're giving you that, but. That's stuff that you got to pay the recording studios with. You got to pay that. They'll send you where you want to go, but you're paying the bill with all that stuff. And now you owe them all that. And man, he was feeling pretty hurt and bad about being on the hook. He said he's basically sold his soul to the record companies because they're not making. They're just he's just making music to because he likes the music, but you know, you know, he's just because they got him by the short and curlies, you know. Yep. Yep. So That's they right. they they basically own him. Because you know, yeah. this is not in the day where you can record your own stuff in your backyard with up to date stuff and the technology right. that we have, and you can, you know, record stuff in your own house and be just as good as any studio. This is the time where you were they were you were beholden to them. So when we got the we got I think I think I can't remember if it was Century Media and I might be wrong, guys, but forgive me. But I was like I was I wasn't about to sell myself for seven albums, you know. I said we can get 30, 40 people in the club. You know what I'm saying? I don't know yeah. if we can sell seven albums and then we owe them all this fucking money. All this, I'm sorry for cursing. All oh, this no, money. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. All this money forever. You know, I'm 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 too streetwise to make deals like that where I can't come up. If I suppose my throat goes out, suppose Shane breaks his arm or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Then I don't know if we're going to be playing without him. You know, because we're dedicated to each other. So something like that. It's not. It's we're not an LLC now. I know about L a cor corporation or something like that. You know, yeah, sure. we're not cranking out stuff just because we're trying to get rich. Yeah. So I was real hesitant about signing stuff and these record companies and and so we did the the compilations and stuff like that because you know and we just took like. 10, 10, 10 copies as payment or something like that for us to keep, you know, and they can make whatever money they wanted. Yeah. So, yeah, it became work. It, stuff became sketchy, you know, at, at, after everybody shows, what do you mean you guys not signed? What do you mean you guys not signed? You know what I'm saying? We'll sign you for this. We'll sign you for that. We'll sign you for that. People go out of their ways to get signed, you know? We had yeah, people sure. throwing contracts at us and sign this and sign, you know, you could you can sign for with us and we promise you this, that, and the other thing. I was like, screw you guys. I don't know you. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So Absolutely. I might have been a little paranoid, but I think it kept us out of trouble in the yeah. future. At the same time, kind of didn't let us progress because, you don't know, they can, uh, we didn't know anything about record deals overseas or like, like, um, sure. like my brother in law, um, you know, 
my brother-in-law. Um, he knows about recordings and sending stuff overseas and 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 all that stuff. So at the time we didn't know any of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So um so uh one question that I, you know, usually ask towards the end uh, mm -hmm. is do you think that there's like a Bronx heavy sound? Um you know, one that's like unique to the Bronx? The answer could be no. If you think the answer is yes, though, um, how would you describe that sound? Or, you know, maybe it's not a sound, but something else, like an attitude or something like that. Um, I, I think, I think our greatest, uh, from Durham by Hater, I think our greatest contribution was the feeling of unity in the scene. Yeah. And are aggressive and um in your face attitude. Sure. And that, I think that was our contribution. I think it was mu I mean, music wise, it was uh, a little bit on the softer side, I sure. think. To what I think the Bronx, if you look at the Bronx for what it is in its history, I think it leans more towards like the I rates. Um, the I raised the Billy Club sandwiches, you know, Martin running around with a bit little baseball bat. Yeah. yeah. Like that, that type of aggression and and deep, you know, tune down the low D or whatever it is, sure. you know, that that stomp, that that in your face stomp, as opposed to like, you know, and then you got the Bronx, I don't know, you can you can say you got the like the that like the Bronx aggressive street hood hardcore and then you got like the, the crossover like the thrashes and, and stuff like that like the hellbounds that yeah, sure. are really good for like people that don't like that other stuff yeah so i think that it's not so much a, a bronx style as much as a bronx feeling or a bronx attitude and yeah. each one expresses that in their own way and brings a little something to the table in, in their own through their own visions through their own experiences through the sounds that they grew up with like you got the guys that grew up with metallica you know now you're going to have the guys that are growing up with the irates listening to irate That's you know right. you might take their sound and mix it with i don't know some keyboards or some funky progressive stuff and you know you get you're going to have a kid that sounds like phil and 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 uh and martin with some offbeat goofy I don't know, off time drum stuff. You know, it's, like, it's I don't know. You know, and everybody takes it to a little, but they'll be spitting out the same things. You know, so their, their attitudes, and hopefully it's the attitudes and truth and what they're seeing, and hopefully they're spitting it out to make things better. So what yeah. I fell off about rap music, you know, and they, they kind of fell off, and they not rhyming and not trying to get people to do better and promoting a lot of the negativity that we hated in the first place. Sure. You know, sure. hopefully the new generations can uh, work towards trying to get kids and, and the youth and all the new folks to pr promote some unity and, and uh, prosperity as opposed to, you know, we're trying to get out of the hoods, you know, make yeah. the hoods and so much get out of the hoods, but make the hoods better. You yeah, know? for sure. For sure. If that makes any sense. Yeah, a, a whole lot of sense. Um, so is there anything that you'd like to add that we haven't talked about yet um, or things that you'd like to say in closing? Oh, I just want to thank everybody for always coming out and supporting Driven by Haitian. Sorry we didn't get to last as long as all these other guys, but I hope we made an impact. And man, I miss all of you. I wish I could just big hugs to everybody. For sure. Wonderful. So many people. I wish I could remember everybody's names. I yeah. can't remember names for sure, but I remember people's faces. Absolutely. I'll, I'll, we'll see each other around. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Tito. Right on, brother.